Yeah. <laughs> okay, get it. Okay, but a rock has essence, has being, but doesn't have person. You can't talk to a rock. You can, but it's just if it talks back, <laughs> you need to put it away. Um, I have one being, one essence, one person. Rock has one essence, no person. I have one being, one person. God has one essence, three persons. How hard is that? It's only hard because really there's nothing else in the world that compares to it. There's no other being. You know, people say, well, God's like water. He's like, he's like ice and he's like steam and he's like liquid. No, because that's modalism. That's an improper view of the Trinity. I'm sorry. And I know many of you have used that analogy, but that's not a good analogy. And if I had time to teach on Trinity, which is not in my notes, I'm kind of in my, I'm in my book now, I better stop. But God it has no analogous being in the universe. There is none likened to the Lord. So there's no way to really say, God is like this. Because He's not. There is only one like you. Thus, when it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, remembering that the Word is Christ, in the beginning was Christ, and Christ was with God, and Christ was God. When we understand that, we understand certain things about Christ. Number one, we understand He is eternal. Number two, we understand He is in communion with the Father. Because He is with God, with the God. And number three, we understand He is fully divine. And if, and if, if we have trouble with the first verse... Just go right to the second verse and it, and it explains it further. It says, the same, speaking of the Logos of the Word, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him and without Him was not anything made that was made. Christ is Creator of all. The one who came in the manger was the one who formed the world. Amazing how doctrine can be so inspiring, isn't it? Doctrine isn't boring. Doctrine is exciting when you really start to study it. Jesus Christ is deity. Colossians 2.9 says, For in Him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Colossians 1.15, He is the image of the invisible God. By, him's all, by Him all things were created. In heaven and earth, invisible and invisible. Revelation 22.13, Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. I am the beginning and the end. When Thomas saw Jesus... And Jesus said, here, touch my scars. He, he looked down, he got down on his knees, he says, my Lord and my God. And Jesus didn't correct him. Jesus didn't say, hey, don't call me that. Why? Because he was absolutely right. <clears throat> Lord and God. Christos and Theos. He is Lord and God. And understanding that is what makes verse 14 so important, by the way. You know, set a start in verse 14. Verse 14, the Word became flesh because it is God who became flesh. The eternal Logos, the one who created everything, entered into His own creation in the person of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Nazareth. Such an exciting thing should not just be reserved to be celebrated only at Christmas, by the way. We should be celebrating the Word becoming flesh all year long. Now, I've been speaking kind of theologically and, and linguistically now for a few minutes because I wanted to share with you the importance of the Word. Who it is we're celebrating. This Word is God. 
But now I want to move to a, another equally important part of this consideration, another equally important part of this passage that I wanted to ensure that got in here. And, and the thing, again, the reason why I'm jumping around a little bit is it speaks a little bit about John the Baptist and, and though it is a very, very important part of the passage, I'm not going to deal with those right now. I want you to go to verse 11. Because this is the exhortation concerning the Word. We've seen the miracle of the Word. He became flesh. We've seen the nature of the Word. He is God who became flesh. Now let's look at the exhortation concerning the Word. John 1.11 He came to His own. And His own people did not receive Him. But to all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become the children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. As I said, in there, as I said earlier, I can't exegete everything in this passage, but I wish I could. But I did not want to leave this part out. I did not want to leave this part out because I, I feel like I would be remiss if I did so. Because John makes a point here that Jesus came unto His own and they refused Him. Specifically, this refers to the Jewish nation, but more broadly, this also has application for all of humanity because mankind as a whole rejects Christ. In fact, apart from the Holy Spirit's empowerment... The Bible teaches that mankind always rejects Christ. No one can come to me unless it is granted to him by my Father. Mankind rejects Christ. And the sad thing is, those who reject Christ reject the only way of salvation. But note verse 12. But to all who did receive Him, He gave the right to become children of God. And my question to all who are under the sound of my voice is very, very simple. Which category are you in? Have you received Christ or are you rejecting Christ? Now I want to let you know I am not the Holy Spirit. I do not have the power to save nor do I have the power to convert you to salvation. And John makes an important point about salvation. He says that our being born again, our regeneration does not come about through the flesh. You're not born again because your parents were born again. You're not born as a Christian. It doesn't come about through our work. You cannot work your way into heaven no matter how hard you try. And it doesn't come about through the will. We can't just decide to be born again. Being born again is something God does to us. It is a miracle in us. Regeneration is a sovereign act of God. How do you know if you have been born again? You have received Christ. Thus I ask, have you received Christ? If you have, it is because the Spirit of God has opened your heart to receive Him. All I can do is proclaim the call of God to everyone, which is this. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. This is the promise to all who did receive Him, you will be given the right to become children of God. And I leave you with that exclusive call. Jesus is the only Savior... To reject Him is literally, as we've learned from this passage, is to reject God. To reject Him is to reject the one who, who, who humiliated Himself, came to the earth, took upon Himself flesh to save His people from their sin. To reject Him is foolish indeed. But to receive Him is to receive life eternal. Thus the call of the gospel. Repent and believe. Let us pray.